So we're so glad to have the Johnsons with us and uh, missionaries to South Africa and uh, their precious children. It's been great to uh, meet them at family camp and talk to Titus there and have them now with us today. It's a great uh, blessing. Brother Johnson, how long has you and your wife, your family, you told us earlier, but how long have you been in South Africa? Uh, so we've been there 14 years now. Okay, use the mic if you would, because we're actually going to record this. And... Yeah, we've been there 14 years. Great. Now tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you met each other, when you got married, and uh, tell us some about your children. Sure. So I grew up in Western Canada. Uh, I was born in British Columbia, and my grandfather was a pastor. My dad was a Christian school administrator and principal. And so we lived in uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia for a number of years. I moved to Prince Albert, Saskatchewan for about four years as a young, young man. Uh, when my parents were living there and working in the school. And then we moved back to Alberta, I think I was about 13 years old, and grew up most of the rest of my teenage years in Alberta. Um, I drove um, cattle truck for a living, got working when I was about 15 years old, and uh, working on farms, and then uh, through a variety of circumstances, God moved me out to British Columbia again. And I ended up in the interior of BC, in a place close to Kelowna. <coughs> And working there at a feedlot, uh, got back into church, really. I had kind of gotten away from the Lord. Um, not often to wicked sin, but just living my life, working, earning money, and not really following the Lord probably like I should. And so God, through a variety of circumstances, led me back into a church in Kelowna, B.C. And uh, it was a great blessing to be back in church. I enjoyed being back into a church that was trying to grow was busy soul winning and there was opportunities to serve the Lord but uh, I lived quite a ways from the church at that time still about an hour and a half away to drive every Sunday and I remember some of the people in the church were uh, jokingly sharpening me and challenging me that I should live closer to the church and I said okay well problem is I'm working 80 hours a week at the feed lot and uh, how am I going to have time to find a job? So I prayed really hard one weekend that God would give me a job closer to the church. I said specifically, I said, Lord, I need you to give me a job because I am working so many hours, Monday through Saturday, I don't have time to look for one. And so I went into work on Monday morning after praying that prayer, and they laid me off. And I walked out of that office that day saying, God, no. I said I need you to give me a job because I don't have time to look for one. I didn't say give me time to look for a job. <laughs> so God tested me. I believe that God often tests us before he brings blessings into our life. I believe God wants to try our heart. He wants to prove both to uh, show us what's important to us and also that we can show him that we love him. And so I, for about two months, looked for a job, and I couldn't find one. I looked everywhere. My old boss back in Alberta started calling me, and he said, I want you to come back. He said, uh, it was a small trucking company about that time, about eight or ten trucks. He said, I'm going farming. I bought my uncle's farm. I want you to come and run the trucking company, and I'll start selling it to you. And I was about 21 years old, 22 years old. But there was no good church to go to there. And so I prayed about it for a little bit and I called him and I said, no, I can't. I said, I'm convinced God wants me here. And I couldn't find a job. So I was witnessing to a man at a gas station and talking to him. I'd, I'd use that gas station a lot. And he said, well, there's a company down the road hiring. I said, which company? I haven't heard of anybody hiring. He said, it's called waste management. I said, garbage company? And I walked away from the gas station that night thinking, oh, I don't think I'm interested. But then God just kept working on my heart and I needed a job. So I went down and applied and they wanted to hire me immediately because most people don't apply at waste management with any driving experience. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I thought, oh, maybe I can do this, picking up those bins with the front end truck and dumping. It's like a forklift, you know, type of a thing. Maybe that'll be easy to do. I said, okay, where do I sign? And they said, and, and I said, what do I start with? And they said, no, 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 no. Everybody starts with residential garbage. And this was before the bins. 
This is when you manually took the bags under the trash can and threw them into the truck. And I walked under the door and I said, God, no way. And he said, you wanted a job. I swallowed my pride because I drove fancy Cataliners, Peterbilts. When we went through town, everybody stopped and looked at you driving by. And I became a garbage man. <laughs> Four months, five months, I guess, after doing that job driving garbage truck, uh, being in the church, helping in the church, getting serving the Lord again, my wife came up from Colorado to visit her sister, who was the pastor's wife, and we met. And uh, so we met in March. We started courting in April. We were engaged in July and married in October. And God was in. Now, we didn't like each other at first. <laughs> she made the number one mistake that, you, that, that new people make to a Baptist church. They sit in somebody else's spot. So our first Sunday at church, I walked in and she's sitting in my spot. <laughs> so I walked up to her and I said, you're sitting in my spot. <laughs> and she looked at me and like, so? <laughs> and we didn't like each other because people were trying to match make and encourage us to consider one another. And <clears throat> so we were de both determined no. And that lasted about a month. And God changed that all around. And so I do joke about the reason my, my wife did marry a garbage man. I was still driving a garbage truck at that point, uh, but it was because she wanted a man in uniform, amen? <laughs> amen. So how many years have you been married now? 21. I'll be 21 now. this October. Okay. Talk, talk to us a little bit, Brother Johnson, about how God specifically worked in your heart to begin calling you to be a missionary and to go to South Africa. I think even from a young man, I'd made some decisions at camp to give my life to the Lord and do whatever God wanted me to do. Uh, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, I just had a desire to serve God. I always thought that I would just grow up and serve Him in youth, uh, help with camp ministries. Uh, out west, there was a great need for a lot of those things. And I just felt that God wanted something, but I never knew what. So I just took whatever opportunity I could growing up, helped at camps. I uh, helped with various things that were going on. Um, and then once we, I went, ended up in Kelowna, British Columbia, and we were married, we just helped in the church doing anything we could do. Uh, we taught youth class. We helped do the church books. I drove the bus uh, for the church Sunday school bus. Um, you know, we cleaned the church. We just did what needed to be done. And God always was impressing on our hearts that there was something more he wanted for us. But we didn't have any leading as to what that was. So because missions was important to us, it was something that was a priority in our giving, um, we began praying about taking a missions trip. And we started praying about where, and we looked at the missionaries that our church supported, and God began to direct our attention and desire to go to South Africa to visit a missionary that our church supported. And we started making preparations to go. And for about three years, we tried to take a missions trip. Every time we tried, something would happen and the door would close and we couldn't go. And we, but at the same time, God just kept bringing everything about South Africa to our attention. I mean, I'd never even noticed the country before. And now it was like every time we heard anything, it was about South Africa. And so we kept praying and we kept trying. And finally, in 2005, we were able to take a trip. And I had already told my pastor at that point, I don't know what God's doing, but I think there's something more than a trip that God is doing here. And he knew that as we went. We spent just over three weeks, I think, in the country. And God really opened our eyes both to the need, but also to the opportunity. And um, there is so much openness in South Africa that we have not had in North America for decades in being able to share the gospel. And we really were burdened. But I did not want to be a missionary that went because of a burden. I needed to know that God had given us a call. And so we came back home, pretty certain that's what God wanted us to do. But we talked to our pastor, we prayed about it for another three months, and God just solidified in all of our hearts that that is what he wanted us to do. God gave me some scripture on it, and I was curious because everybody says God will lead you through scripture. And I thought, well, how is he going to tell me South Africa out of the Bible? 
but he had a way of doing it that I didn't anticipate. There's a verse in the book of Habakkuk where God told the prophet to get out of the land of the north and go into the south. And I was just reading that one night in my devotions. I wasn't seeking anything. I was just reading my Bible and God drew my eyes to that passage of scripture and it jumped out at me. I, I was so excited. I woke up my wife. She had fallen asleep already. I woke her up. I'm like, look at this. She's like, huh? I went back to sleep. But God gave it to me. And um, we're glad. Then I went to my pastor. And I said to my pastor, okay, we, we know God's will. And we, we're excited now. We know God wants us to go to South Africa. So when do we start? And he looked at me. And he said, I want you to wait two years. Now, I thought my pastor had a hole in his head. And his brains had fallen out. My whole life, I was about 20 six probably at the time my whole life i've been searching for god's will in a specific way now i know it people are dying and my pastor wants me to wait two years and he honestly he said he wanted time to prepare the church to send us because we were sent out of our local church and he felt there were some things we still needed to learn and mature in so I went home and grumbled and complained, and I thought, where can I move my membership to? Where can I find a pastor that understands God's call for my life? Because obviously they don't hear. And after I calmed down, and I realized that I needed to accept authority, and I needed to accept God's plan of working through authority, we submitted ourselves to our pastor. We waited two years and prepared to go, got things ready. And then we were out on deputation one year, and God gave us full support. And I believe that's because of two reasons. Number one, because we'd heavily been investing in missions already. And I believe God gave us some sowing and reaping. Secondly, I believe it was because we submitted to our pastor and to the authority God put in life. So that was January of 2009, we arrived in South Africa. I think there's a fairly great divide in South Africa between the upper class and the lower class. And uh, the South Africans that I meet in Richmond Hill and Vaughan in our area, I would say are more of those from the upper class that have come to live here. I think you more minister in one of the areas that is lower class per se. You know what I mean by that. Maybe tell us some things about the, the culture of South Africa, things that you had to learn things that were different, things you've had to adapt to. Um, talk to us some about the, maybe the people, the culture, their way of thinking, things you learned as you went there. There is a great inequality in that way. Um, there is a very wealthy, uh, which is a minority in the country, and there is a very large population that is poor. Uh, we don't have a lot of middle class. Um, South Africa is ranked number one for inequality in the as far as living standard and comfort and convenience. Um, there is a lot of racial division from previous generations, especially the apartheid era. And ironically, you will meet people that value apartheid and you will meet people that don't. And so there is a lot of misinformation on both sides of it. Um, I have met many black South Africans that say life was better under apartheid than it is today. And that's because there wasn't as much corruption, crime was enforced, and there were a lot of jobs. When everything switched in 1994, um, corruption just began to abound. And those that could get rich got rich and kept it and looked for ways to get richer. And those that were poor continued to suffer. And so we are at now over 50% unemployment in the country, even though we are a nation full of mineral wealth, anything from coal to gold to platinum, um, it's there. <coughs> and um, there is a lot of corruption, a lot of abuse of power, a lot of misuse of money. And there is a lot of very wealthy people, but the vast majority of the population is uh, we are 60 million people in South Africa now. Uh, the size of our country, we would be about 10% larger than the province of Ontario as far as land. 
Um, the people are very easy to talk to, very open, very friendly. Um, there is some racial division, but obviously being that we are from Canada, when they understand that, that immediately tears down a lot of barriers. They can't figure out why we would come from Canada to South Africa when everybody else is trying to go the other way. Even whites we talk to think we're crazy because why would we live in South Africa when they want to leave? And we always take them back to, well, it's what God has called us to do and people need to hear the Lord. Uh, the people are very outgoing, very sociable people. Uh, always, as I mentioned this morning, everybody, you have to greet everyone. That was a cultural thing. Uh, as Canadians, we're used to just being busy and doing what we do. Um, I would even have the habit when I got there of going to up to the youth as they're gathered at church and maybe saying hi to one or two, but then starting things, and they considered that rude. Literally, you have to greet everybody, either individually or as a group, when you come into a conversation or a group of people. If we go out soul winning there, you don't ignore anybody walking down the street. You don't ignore anybody in their yard. If you're walking down the road and somebody is standing outside in their yard, you have to wave and greet them. Literally everyone you see. And so that was a different cultural background that we were not used to. Um, there's a lot of different things in food, um, but there is a lot of British influence in the country. So we eat a lot of the similar foods to North America. Uh, the main breakfast cereals in South Africa are Cheerios and cornflakes. And uh, so that wasn't hard to adapt to. And um, so a lot of those things are similar in that way. But they do have a lot of different cultures in their food. Uh, there is a lot of African ancestral worship that took a little bit to understand. And I'm still not there in understanding it all. Um, but to understand what is right and what is wrong. And what is good, what is bad in that. And always to, I guess maybe also to understand that just because people do something in a different way than what I did it or had learned to do it doesn't make it wrong. And sometimes when we go to another country, uh, we tend to look down on people and think that our way is a better way of doing it when it's just a different way of doing it. Uh, something we have to learn and I think we've God has taught us even just because people struggle with English doesn't mean that they're not intelligent and they're not well educated and everybody struggles English is not the first language for most of the world um, I've been learning English my whole life and I'm still not well or good at speaking it and um, so it's it's been humbling to learn how to minister to people how to love people and how to accept people um, they are very open to the gospel uh, most Africans would consider themselves Christian, at least in South Africa. Uh, Muslims are not a predominant force in the country, although they are increasing rapidly. Um, but most of their salvation or their Christianity uh, would be based upon church membership, uh, baptism, or some type of a work salvation. And so it takes a lot of time to show them that what they are trusting is not Bible salvation, so that they can understand the gospel in order to be saved. Anybody have a question you want to uh, want to ask? I'll, I'll share it. Anybody got a question, Brother Abraham? I was going to ask if you guys do like bilingual service, like with a translator, or do you speak to it? Brother Abraham is asking if they ever have bilingual services. Yes, we do. So on Sunday morning, uh, because a lot of the older people and the younger children still struggle with English. Uh, we have one of our young men who's graduated from the Bible Institute that interprets the service into Zulu. And so I preach and then he interprets, you know, so we start and stop all the time. Uh, but the rest of the time, our Bible studies, anything we do in the high schools, even some of the primary schools, all of that is done in English because it's becoming so strong and predominant in the country. Anybody else got a question? Christian? Is soccer popular in South Africa? No, soccer is not, but football is. <laughs> so in South Africa, they call it football. They don't call it soccer. And uh, we were at camp last week, and Brother Shane said, we're going to have a football game, counselors against the campers. And I got excited. Then I got out there and found out they meant American football, not African football. <laughs> America 
this is the only place in the world that calls it soccer. Always has to be different. <laughs> don't like the English language, they create their own English language. They spell everything different. Amen. Anybody else got a question that you'd like to ask? Think about it. Think about some questions. Maybe something they said or just something you'd, you'd like to ask about. Mrs. Johnson, what for, uh, what for you was one of the biggest adjustments to living in South Africa? Um, probably one of the biggest adjustments was leaving your family, away from uh, parents and sisters and brothers. You kind of have to have your husband as your best friend because <laughs> you don't really have any anymore because they've left them. But that was probably one of the biggest ones. Um, just when you first go to the country because you don't know the people and you don't know the culture that well, you always felt as if you were out of place. Um, but you, the Lord teaches you things. He teaches you just to adapt, um, to be content with where you are. That was one of the biggest things. To be honest, I didn't have a desire like my husband to first go to South Africa. I mean, God had to work me over personally to come to that place in my life. Um, we've had to adapt to the pace of life, um, which we actually enjoy now. When we first went there, everything was so slow. Um, but we're used to that now, so when we come back to North America, everything's so fast, mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming. It's actually a reverse culture shock mm -hmm. to come back here. Just dealing with different things. So the medical system is pretty similar to here. Um, so we, you know, I had three of my children were born there. We had surgeries, things there. We have a good doctor, and so that's not so difficult. Um, but basically, it's just learning how to adapt to the people. And like my husband said earlier, just realizing it, just because they do something different from the way I would do it doesn't mean that their way is wrong. <coughs> learning to to kind of think like them is important. And when we go to a country as a missionary, we're not really going there to change their culture, per se. We're trying to bring them to Christ. Now, if there are things in their culture or their way of thinking that contradict the Bible and God's word in the way he'd want us to think or want us to act, then it's wrong. People need to be taught. But if there are just things about culture and so on that, you know, they're, they're, they're nothing that the Bible would, would speak against. There's nothing wrong with it biblically. That's okay. You know, people have come from different places and different, uh, different things culturally and so on. Anybody got a, a question? Ms. Julia? It, it, it's, it's mostly everybody's learning English now? So we have 11 official languages, well, 12 now. 12 official languages now. And... Um, English is the most predominant in the country now. Most schools are teaching it either as first or second language. So most of the young people um, are learning it in school, they're watching it on TV, they're on their phones, and they're learning English. Um, but there is a number of different African languages, um, and that depends on which area of the country, which tribes they were from. Yeah. The area of the country we're in is more of a melting pot. Um, we are surrounded by coal mines and there is more employment, well, there's supposed to be more employment in our area. And so people will actually come from all over the place hoping to get a job at a mine and have a, a good career. And so we get a lot of people that move from all over the country, but most of them don't find jobs, but now they don't always have a way to go home, so they, they struggle. And so, but with English, yeah, we can do so much in the country now. Most of the time, people think we're Afrikaans, and the whites speak Afrikaans, which is a mix of Dutch, German, and English. And so, if somebody tries to speak Afrikaans to me um, at the grocery store or at the cashier or something, I'll try to just fake it and smile and nod. Uh, but if they end up having a conversation, then I usually have to interrupt and say, sorry, only English, don't know Afrikaans. So. So I did learn uh, Zulu. I went to university for a year on Saturdays taking courses in Zulu. Uh, the problem was that the Zulu they're teaching in the universities is the pure Zulu that nobody speaks in our area so much. And so that was difficult. And then we got so busy ministering in the schools, there was so much opportunity to do things in English that I didn't pursue more language study. 
And uh, Titus and Tanner, our boys, have picked up Zulu better than even me. Um, I can hear it, but I don't speak a lot of it. And uh, they're pretty fluent in general everyday conversation because they're always around with the youth. Um, our church is entirely black. And so we, in the area in which our church is located, we're the only white people that go down there. So everybody looks at us as weird, then they find out we're the pastor, then they even think we're weirder. But when they see our kids running around the street playing with their kids, going to the shops and buying sweets or ices or things, just like their kids in that area, it tears down a lot of barriers. And they're willing to talk to us because they say, obviously, you're different. Mrs. Johnson, what did you have to maybe learn to do differently as far as uh, grocery shopping, cooking, that sort of thing? Well, for grocery shopping, is it's not um, necessarily what you do, do differently. They do have grocery stores. Um, obviously, we don't have Walmart, but that's okay. But we do have some grocery stores, but the variety is lacking. Whereas you walk into stores here, you have many types of breakfast cereals or things like that. It's not like that there. They have lots on the shelf, but it's just the same product. It's not anything different. So it was necessarily not learning um, how to grocery shop, but maybe just learning to adapt and how to cook meals, what to use, what not to use, what tastes nice, what didn't taste nice. Um, and then for maybe day-to-day -day life, um, we live in a very dirty place because <laughs> we are surrounded by coal mines. So our house is continually black dirt and dust and I'm kind of a neat freak <laughs> so that bothered me <laughs> um, I would spend many days just cleaning all day long and I finally had to come to terms after my husband said you're just gonna kill yourself because I wasn't succeeding at keeping it clean my babies would call around and they'd come black you know um, so that bothered me but the Lord worked with me and just taught me that it's okay and there's not going to be a reward in heaven for having clean house <laughs> So I just learned some of those things. We did have to get used to bugs. When my little ones were crawling and things, I always have to go out early in the morning before they would go out to pick up all the beetles that had died overnight because they didn't pick them up and eat them. So I'd go out there and Tiana would be sitting there. And like, oh, please don't tell me that's a beetle. Yeah, it's a beetle. Protein. So, yeah, protein. <laughs> so just different things like that you have to learn to adapt to. But we had a lot of problems with our power. Um, going off for long periods of times. Um, the first time I went off for a long period of time, my husband actually abandoned me and went to Zimbabwe. I left me by myself. And the power had gone off and it was off for like the whole time he was gone. And so that was trying. And our water goes off for many periods of time. And so learning just how to adapt without those things is, but now becomes a part of life. It truly does. The water goes off for like, oh well, the water's off because it becomes a part of life. One of the interesting stories, I was in the hospital and had to have my appendix taken out. And a lot of funny things and happened at that point. Um, one of the funny things was at that point, we had different medical insurance than what we have now. And at that time, they didn't recognize our medical insurance and they wanted a cash payment up front before they would do surgery. So I'm laying in the hospital bed trying to get my credit card to work to make a payment. And I can't remember the pin on my credit card because I hadn't used it in so many years. And so I'm praying, Lord, what's the pin? What's the pin? She's looking for everything at home. But we found it, got it paid, had surgery. And then she's telling me as I'm coming out of surgery that the power has been off, but it's only our house. Everybody else has power. And so we're trying to figure out what's happened. We're trying to figure out what's wrong. They're trying to make complaints to the city, get them to come and investigate. And um, finally, I get released from hospital. I come home, and they still haven't come. And we're calling and calling, and finally they come out. And it's been about four days now with no power. And they, they come out, and they go up to work on the, on the box. They realize that somebody had cut a line by mistake with some construction going on. So they were going to run a temporary line to our house. And this is late at night already. It's dark. I've just come out of the hospital having my appendix taken out. And I'm up there overseeing these electricians because if I leave, they're not going to do it tonight. Then they're drunk. They're dropping their tools. So I'm running back to my house to grab tools to come and lend them to get the power connected so we can get electricity. It's just you learn how to do almost anything in Africa. So.
<coughs> Would you have any uh, ladies in your church that, that uh, you know, they don't have any kind of stove top or whatever and they just cook over a fire? Probably not over, they use kerosene. Okay. As they cook. Some of them do cook outside, but that's not so much where we are. Um, but I do have a lot of ladies in the church that don't have running water. They don't have inside toilets. You know, they have outside toilets. So there are great, they live in tin shacks. They live in, you know, very, very small houses with large families. So there are, is a lot of that in the area where we minister to our babies as well. They, in the area where their church is, um, a lot, most people have electricity, but it's very unreliable. And so they do have things to cook with electricity, but often the electricity will go out for days or longer, sometimes weeks, because a transformer <coughs> will blow, because it's overloaded. A lot of them are stealing electricity and illegal connections. So you walk down the streets and there'll be wires poking up or people have patched everything together. And every once in a while, kids will get killed, especially after rain, because they'll end up stepping in a puddle where electrical lines are running. And our electricity is, is different. Our electricity is 240 volt, not 110. And so it's got a lot more power and a lot causes a lot more harm. Um, but most of them do cook with paraffin when that kind of thing happens, or gas for paint um, somewhat. Um, but um, yeah, there is a lot of, a lot of poor, poor people. Anybody else got a question you would like to ask? Caleb? <clears throat> Caleb asked, what, what are maybe some of the common you know, religious beliefs in the country? So obviously a lot of African cultural traditions, ancestral worship. Um, they believe that when an individual dies, that after a period of time and ceremonies, that they can be, come back as an ancestor. And then they believe basically that that loved one is the messenger between them and God. So if you please them, they will bring God's blessings to you, but if they're not pleased with you, they will stop God's blessings from you. Um, Islam is growing. Uh, there's a lot of Catholicism. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there is some Mormonism, some JWs. Um, the charismatic movement is very big because of the fact that they take and the Bible and just mix it with African cultural traditions and blend it all together. And so they're very superstitious. A lot of people are very superstitious. Uh, they're superstitious about things going wrong. The ancestors, they're displeased. They're scared of the witch doctors, the Songomas and Yangas. And they believe in their power. Even well-educated people like a doctor or a lawyer will go to a witch doctor or Songoma when they have problems. And um, so there's those things. Um, close to us, we have the largest Buddhist temple in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, they built it there. There's not a lot of Buddhists that we've met in South Africa, but there are some. And so you've pretty much got almost any mainstream false belief. Well, tell us maybe a couple stories of, uh, of victory, souls that have gotten saved, people that have grown in the Lord and just become you know, faithful people in the church. Maybe tell us a couple stories like that. One of the first young men I led to the Lord um, in the country is actually now our assistant pastor. And um, I met him, I went to a high school shortly after we were in the country and I just stood outside the high school and handed out gospel tracts as they were coming out. And he took a gospel tract home that day and read it and did not understand how you could have confidence in eternal life. And so he called me and I said, I will gladly come down and meet with you. He told me where he lived and I think he told me where he lived to see if I would actually come because white people don't go down there. And I went down there, went to his house, sat down in his living room and gave him the gospel. He had been raised in a Catholic background. He'd grown up and was even prepping to become an altar boy and maybe even go into Catholic ministry. But he did not understand what the Bible said about his sin, about what Jesus Christ and what he'd done for him. And that day he trusted the Lord as his savior. And so he's grown up, that way he was probably about 13 or 14 when I met him, and he's grown up, graduated from school, uh, went through our Bible Institute, and now he's working as assistant pastor in our church. Uh, we have another young couple that's at the other church, the one next to us, and both of them again uh, came to church as young people. Um, Marcus uh, was lost, and 
And we had the opportunity of leading him to the Lord and seeing him grow in his Christian life. Uh, Montepello as well, her father died at a young age and she kind of spent a lot of time around us and even living in our Bible Institute dormitories. And uh, both of them went through the Bible Institute, graduated uh, last year, 2020. They got married, June of 2020. And God completely blessed them with a child. And uh, now he just turned one two weeks ago on Sunday. And they're expecting number two in September. And so um, the other young man, Raymond, I mentioned first, he's also courting a young lady that went to our Bible college and has graduated. And they're looking forward to getting married. A um, lot of just opportunities as you go out in the streets. We saw a lot of young people get saved in the high school ministries. Uh, the high schools are so open there. Uh, we can actually go into the high schools and they'll gather them together with uh, an assembly and allow us to stand there and preach the gospel for 15 or 20 minutes. We were able to go in and do um, um, Bible studies at break time. And so the young people can choose to take their break and come sit in Bible study in a classroom. And the one high school, we started with about three kids that were doing it, trying to get it going. And we had upwards to over 100 kids attending when we uh, stopped doing that a few years ago because of just busyness and COVID and everything else that showed up. So a lot of opportunities. Just, just There are a lot of lives that you just, uh, lives that have been ruined in sin. We've got another faithful family in the church right now. And the young lady started coming with a small child. Um, she had been saved, but walked away from the Lord. Started coming to church. Got her boyfriend to start coming to church. And we were praying and he got saved. And then they started growing in the Lord. They weren't married. And it took a number of years. Uh, it's very complicated to get married in South Africa. There's with the African customs and a dowry system. But finally, uh, two years ago in the middle of COVID, they said enough and they went and got married and joined the church as that was hindering them from joining. And they're probably the most, one of the most faithful families in the church today. And God's just done a tremendous change in their lives. And uh, we, could, we could talk a long time. There's a lot of stories. I think you've mentioned a couple different churches, maybe Solid Rock, Baptist, and Hope Baptist. So what's the difference between the two? Now, you've been a part of both of those ministries. Maybe explain that a little bit. So Solid Rock Baptist Church, we live adjacent to it, and that's where our Bible Institute dormitories are. And we, when we moved there, we moved into the house that belonged to the former missionary, and we still live there today. He already had a national pastor instituted at the church there, and so we assisted for a number of years before God directed us to start a church plant about 20 minutes away, which is Hope Baptist Church. Predominantly, we spend our time now at Hope Baptist Church, but actually there's a transition now where that older pastor is stepping aside. Um, he's, he doesn't feel called to pastor. He just kind of tried to do the best he could to keep things together. Uh, the young man, Marcus, doesn't feel like he's quite ready to be the pastor by himself. So as I go back, I'm going to actually be overseeing both churches and then continuing to help these young men uh, become the pastors. God has uh, used the Johnson family in South Africa. And I'm very excited about their ministry and want us to have a part in helping them and supporting them in the, in the future. Um, those that watch this online, We'll show you in just a, just a couple minutes a video update from the Johnsons earlier this year where they talk some about the Bible Institute and the property that God's given them now for Hope Baptist Church, correct? And, and uh, their desire to build a building on there and a, a parsonage or a place where the assistant pastor could live, you know, the, the South African man. And so pray for that. Pray for those needs. Pray for God to provide, as you saw this morning, uh, what it would cost. We could build a shed for that amount of money in Canada, but uh, that money can go a long way in South Africa. And just pray for God to provide what is needed to uh, to help them and help the church go forward. Pray for the Bible Institute. Pray for their family. Pray for pray for the church. How many students are in the Bible Institute right now? So we have eight students full time this term. Um, in the last number of years, we started the Bible Institute in 2013. So we have about 13 students that have graduated now out and are working in about six different churches in the country. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. It's a blessing what God has done. Uh, what, what God has done. Greetings from South Africa. As many of you have read in our recent prayer letters, 
We're going to be taking a short furlough in the next couple of months to North America. But because we cannot travel and personally visit each and every one of you, we wanted to give you a quick update on some of the ministries here. Here at Hope Baptist Church, we are excited at what God has done and is doing. As many of you know from last year, after many years of labor and prayer, God miraculously led us to a piece of property for sale and quickly supplied the finances that would be needed to purchase it. With excitement, we purchased the property. We began to make plans to clean it and fence it. And uh, But as we moved forward, all of a the sudden there was opposition from the surrounding community. There were rumors. Uh, there was um, verbal threats. And we experienced opposition like we have never seen before during our time of ministry here. Very quickly, we realized that Satan was working to discourage us and to try to hinder us from moving forward for God's glory. All we could do is pray, and we prayed. We brought it before the Lord and asked God to intercede for us and change the hearts of people. After several months in prayer, God answered. God began to change the hearts of the people. God began to give us favor in the eyes of the community. God opened the door for us to clean the land, to fence it, then to set up the tent and begin to have services. God enabled us to begin to do uh, youth outreaches and activities for children in the community. And through all of that, God began to give us favor in their sight. God is still working now today. We are seeing visitors come to church regularly. We are seeing people saved, baptized, and added into the church. We are seeing young people and children that are still coming and attending and are growing in their knowledge and understanding of their need of a savior. We're seeing the homes in the community become open and the opportunities to witness to adults of the gospel. But as we look ahead, we have a great need. We need a building. As you see, we're meeting under a tent and we've been able to rent portable toilets, but we have no water or electricity on the property. And that becomes a problem when we have larger services or children's outreaches and events, especially if it's a hot day and everyone's thirsty. The city has warned us that we cannot continue to use the tent long term as it does not meet the building codes. And if we want water connections and other things on the property, we must submit building plans and build a permanent structure. As we've prayed, God has led us to an architect that offered his services to us for free here. And he's finished the plans for a church building in a small parsonage. And they are now going to the municipality for approval. And we're praying. They are estimating that a building and the parsonage could cost about 3 million rand in here in South African money. That seems like a lot, but with the current exchange rates that are so favorable, it would be less than 200,000 US dollars to build both a permanent structure for the church and a small parsonage for the assistant pastor. We've encouraged our people to do what they can, but honestly, here in South Africa, we are at over 50% unemployment in the country and if most people get an entry level job, they will make less than 200 US dollars a month to try to survive on and take care of their families. So we're doing what we can, but we're praying and asking God to help us do what we can. So please, would you join with us in prayer that God would open the door and enable us to build a building to use for his honor and his glory. Another important ministry I wanna give you a brief update on is the Bible Institute. Now, the Bible Institute is a full-time ministry for us. We have dormitories here at the property at Solid Rock Baptist Church, and we live adjacent to it. Uh, the Bible Institute is designed to give uh, an opportunity to young men and women that are serious-minded about wanting to live for God and serve Him, and give them a place where they can get apart and study and train. Uh, we have some that come for one year, just to be strengthened in their Christian life before they go off to uh, further education or into a career. But we have a number that are focused on a three-year course. And during that time, they are intensively trained in Bible doctrine and practically taught and equipped on how to serve the Lord so that they can go back and be a help in their local church. At the end of this year, we will have had 13 young people that have graduated from that three-year course and are actively serving the Lord in six different churches throughout the country. And we're grateful for what God is doing for their continued love for the Lord and their continued seriousness and dedication to be involved in serving the Lord 
and we're glad for the fruit that abounds both to your account and others as they give to support this needed ministry. Please continue to pray for it, and please continue to pray that God would raise up young men and women that would have that desire to serve God and reach their country with the gospel. And lastly, we just want to say a brief thank you from us as a family. We've been privileged to be serving the Lord here in South Africa now for just over 13 years. Uh, Titus is now 14 years old, Tanner is 12, Tayden is 8, and Tiana is 7. And we're grateful for your prayers and your faithfulness to the Lord and to us as a family. So from all of us, thank, thank you. you.